Let us rise in body and or spirit for our opening hymn 346. Come, sing a song with me.
Good morning. morning. I am not Helen Dingus. I am Reverend Jay Wolin, settled minister here at the Unitarian Universalists of Sarasota. Uh, We especially want to welcome all of you today. I especially want to welcome our visitors, those who are here in person, as well as those who are live streaming today. Uh, We invite all of our visitors to participate in any of the events that we have here. And um, if you want, we encourage you to sign up in either our virtual guest book, which you can find at uusrq.org, or at the table right outside the sanctuary. And if you do sign up, you will get a weekly email of all the uh, events that are happening in our newsletter, as well as some uh, emails with Zoom links for our online events. Um, If you're here in person, uh, also do not forget that um, after the service we will have, I think is today a second potluck? Okay, we're going to have a potluck. So there will be food and we can eat together, break bread and get to know each other. A few announcements today, uh, a reminder. Uh, and there'll be a tables outside for these as well to sign up for uh, Roberta, Roberta's Going Away Party, which will be the 20th of this month. Uh, and you can sign up outside. Um, this is a major milestone uh, for the UUs of Sarasota and a major milestone for Roberta. And she's been such a foundational part of this community for the last 14 years. So let's uh, send her off in style and love. And um, as she heads off to retirement and vacation and all of that good stuff. Uh, also for the 22nd, if this is the last day to sign up for our Passover Seda, um, which is our second one. We had one last year. Uh, but we need you to sign up uh, so we know how much food to prepare. And lastly, um, I did receive an email this morning that Helen is, was not going to be able to make it today. Um, she was going to lead the reflections. Um, I've taken some of her ideas and, um, and created my own reflections in speed sermonating this morning. <laughs> And so now, without further ado, it is always my joy to invite the choir with their beautiful voices.
Our opening reading today is from Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa. We have something in our African community, something that is very difficult to put into English. It is called Ubuntu. Ubuntu is the essence of being human. And it says a solitary human being is a contradiction in terms. I can't be a human being on my lonesome. I wouldn't know how to speak as a human being. I wouldn't know how to think as a human being. I wouldn't know how to talk as a human being. I have to learn from other human beings how to be a human being. And so Ubuntu says, my humanity is bound up in yours. I am only because you are and we then see a person as a person through other persons and that we will need this communal harmony if we're going to survive at all. And so now join me in lighting our chalice over there <laughs> as we share one of our proposed values, interdependence, which is in your order of service and up on the screen. Interdependence, we will create and nurture sustainable relationships of care and respect, mutuality and justice. Good morning. Not sure I'm on yet. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? <laughs> Can you hear me now? No. Waiting on the sound. There I am. <laughs> it was a little confusing having the chalice over there. I, sat, I was sitting and I was like, where's the chalice? Oh my gosh, I moved it. It's so good to see you all here today. So today's story is The Lonely Mailman by Susanna Isern, an illustrated by Daniel Montero Galan. Every morning, just as the sun is rising, the old mail mailman leaves his house with a bag full of letters. He climbs onto his bicycle and he sets off on his way. The mailman goes to each door, rings the bell, and only says four words. Squirrel, letter for you. And he whispers, hedgehog, letter for you. Dear Squirrel, sorry about pricking you yesterday when I bumped into you at the market. To make up for it, come over for dinner at 8 and don't be late, Hedgehog. Dear Hedgehog, I know you pricked me yesterday, but don't worry, I know you didn't mean to. If you invite me for dinner, we can have a chat. I'll be there at 8. See you then, Squirrel. Sometimes the animals that live in the forest would offer him a cup of coffee, but the mailman always smiles and says, no thank you, and rides off in a cloud of dust. Dormouse, letter for you. He never gets off his bicycle. Woodpecker, letter for you. Dear Woodpecker, the tree where you have started to peck is next to my nest, and I now can hardly sleep. Couldn't you move to another tree? Dormouse. Sorry, Dormouse, I only realized yesterday that I'm tapping away next to your nest. I know how much you like to rest, so I'm off to find another tree to peck. Woodpecker. So the animals see him cycling through the forest every day, but they hardly know him. Butterfly, letter for you. In fact, nobody knows anything about the mailman at all. Turtle, letter for you. Beautiful butterflies, there's plenty of room on my shell where you can sunbathe in peace and quiet. And if it starts to rain, you can all come inside for a cup of tea. Turtle. Dear wise old turtle, we'd love to come and visit you to flutter around and keep you cool and sit a while on your lovely shell listening to your tales while we enjoy the sun, the butterflies. So some of the animals think that the mailman is sad, and that's why he doesn't say much. Bear, letter for you. But nobody really knows because nobody's ever asked him. 
Rabbit, letter for you. Dear Bear, when I see you swimming in the lake, I want to be there with you, but I feel a bit scared because I'm afraid to get water in my ears and I can't swim. Rabbit. Dear Rabbit, I have a great idea for while you're bathing in the lake. You can climb up onto my back like a big old boat. Bear. So all through the day, the old man rides around delivering mail in the forest to all the animals, including the fish in the river. And at last, the sun sets and the mailman has no more letters in his bag. Feeling very tired, he heads home. But every night, the mailman sits down in the flickering candlelight and writes letters. They are the letters he's delivering the next day. Invitations, apologies, plans, and messages full of love. He writes until he falls asleep on the top of his typewriter. And the next day, he starts again. So when the mailman is just about to finish his round, something amazing happens. The last letter has his name and address written on the envelope. It's a letter for him. So the mailman nervously heads home. It's the first time he's ever received a letter. And when he arrives, he puts it in the mailbox and he whispers four words. Mailman, letter for you. So he opens up the mailbox, he takes out the letter and he runs into the house. And it says, Dear Mailman, for a long time your letters have filled our days with love and happiness, but now we've discovered your secret, and we want to thank you. And most of all, we want to share our happiness with you, the forest animals. Well, the old mailman's eyes filled with tears. Suddenly, the old doorbell let out a crusty, rusty, in my house it's crusty also, squeak. <laughs> It's the first time anyone has ever come to the mailman's door. So he plucks up his courage and he opens the door. And outside, the forest animals are waiting. And when they see him, they all rush over. And the old mailman smiles and blushes amongst all the cheers and hugs. And then he begins to think about all the letters he'll be writing tonight. So. How many of you have seen people as you go about your daily life without actually seeing them in the grocery line, as you walk the dog, or even in our courtyard during the coffee hour? Some are helping us like the mailman, and some are just there. Yet humans are hardwired to be in community with each other, and deep inside, we have this need to belong, to be seen, to be acknowledged, and to be loved. So some people are too shy or uncomfortable in being social like the mailman, but they still want to belong. Have you ever said to yourself, well, I tried to be friendly, but they didn't want to be? So we assume the unfriendlies are antisocial or something's wrong with them or, or they're, maybe they're just having a bad hair day. But nobody really knows for sure because no one has asked them. So I challenge you to find someone in our courtyard today that is not in conversation and let them know that they are seen, acknowledged, and belong. It might just be your next best friend. So now I invite our children to join me in the West Wing and the youth in the tomb room as we explore the web of community. Thank you.
Centering inwards today. Can we shut this off? A centering inwards today from Marina Keegan, an excerpt and adaptation of the writing The Opposite of Loneliness. We don't have a word for the opposite of loneliness, but if we did, I could say that's what I want in life. It's not quite love, and it's not quite community. It's just this feeling that there are people, an abundance of people, who are in this together, who are on your team. Our groups make us feel loved and safe and part of something, something even on our loneliest nights when we stumble home. We don't have a word for the opposite of loneliness, but if we did, I'd say that's how I feel here. How I feel right now here with all of you, in love, impressed, humbled, scared, and we don't have to lose that. We're in this together. And so now, as we go into a time of silence, I invite you to contemplate what you feel in love with, impressed, humbled, and scared when you feel lonely and what abates your loneliness.
Sound? Okay, let's try. So the Surgeon General's report in 2023 had a report, our epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Loneliness is far more than just a bad feeling. It harms both individual and societal health is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. The mortality impact of being socially disconnected is similar to that caused by smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. Yeah, and even greater than that associated with obesity and physical inactivity. I don't know if it balances up, because I hope so. Um, and, and harmful consequences of a society that lacks social connection can be felt in our schools, workplaces, and civic uh, organizations where performance, productivity, and engagement are diminished." End quote. And now, it is true that COVID, I think, exacerbated loneliness, and, um, but, but this phenomenon has been increasing for decades. I remember a book um, back, I think it was the year 2000, entitled Bowling Alone by uh, Robert Putnam, where he talked about um, how all these social norms were being dropped, like bowling, that those type of events that would bring people together. And, um, and certainly, I think social media um, has had an impact um, on this. However, you know, it's a double-edged sword. I, I do, I'm able to keep in touch with people that I hadn't seen for years, and I can uh, follow their life. And if I am traveling to a city, I can just put on Facebook um, anybody in this city that I'm going to and meet up with. And, um, so there, there are, but it also, there's not that intimate connection when, you have, when you're just communicating on social media. Uh, Helen brought up uh, in her thoughts a very interesting theory of something called third places. Our first place is our home, our second place is our work. And third places are spaces where people could be in public with others and mingle and gather without invitation. So think about parks, bars, coffee shops, libraries, malls. Uh, when my children were young, malls was a very, very popular place, and they would all go and meet up with people there. But um, you know, I don't know that I personally go into a coffee shop with the expectation of meeting up you know, and talking with people I do not know. Um, but all of these have been third places where people could be in public with others. You know, and, just, and, and, so, you know, and so you're not alone necessarily. Now, you know, I will say that some of my friends growing up, I grew up in a very Catholic neighborhood, and they had seven or eight brothers or sisters. Uh, and so they were never alone. <laughs> um, and they sometimes would switch their uh, birth certificates. So, uh, yeah, you could get one of the older ones to play on your little league team. And we had a good team that year, I'm just saying. Um, but, uh, I think, but I do think that brings up a very interesting uh, distinction between being alone and loneliness. Right? Being alone is just a, a physical manifestation of being alone. The feeling of loneliness can happen whether you are alone or with others. I mean, if you're an extreme extrovert, like you could go to a coffee shop and just chat up the person sitting at the next table. Um, and you might be able to integrate into a community. I do know also, you know, in um, you know, playgrounds, right? You know, uh, now these these uh, groups are formed, like you know, sort of parties going to the playground together. It's all planned, um, and so sometimes it's harder to break into that if you're not part of that planned group as a, a child or as a parent. I would say, um, and you know, 
You know, if you are an introvert, it is just harder to integrate yourself into third places. In fact, going to a third place sometimes uh, by yourself can make you feel even lonelier, at least in my experience. I know it's shocking for you to believe that I am an introvert, um, uh, but I am. Uh, I tested on the Myers-Briggs twice, and, uh, but I am an introvert who has learned to express himself very well, um, and that has helped me, and I am a curious person, and so that has helped me. But really, uh, introvert and extrovert is, you know, an introvert, they, it, well, extrovert gains energy when they interact with people, and the introvert, it takes their energy when they interact with people, if, if they do interact with people. Um, and so often they will not if they don't feel safe or comfortable. But, you know, I grew up in, in New York City, a city of eight million people. And um, although sometimes it's nice to be among other people, to abate being alone, if you do not have a connection to others, it's a reminder of how alone you are. And I think this highlights another point. The opposite of loneliness is not, is, is not just not being alone, but actually feeling connected to something or someone else and being able to be your authentic self. So in the first place, in your home, that can happen, but with the nuclear family, there are only a few connections. And um, you often have a role within a family. And, and it's hard sometimes um, to be your authentic self. You have responsibilities. If you're a single, if you're a parent, whether a single parent or not, um, you have responsibility to help your children grow. And, and so sometimes, if you don't have a support system, that can make you feel lonely. In the second place at work, there are risks to being authentically yourself, depending on what uh, profession or work you are in. Um, of course, with more people working remotely, that also limits uh, intimate interactions. And I will say, there's been a, a much more concerted effort not to have intimate interactions at work in the last 20 years due to the abuses that have happened in the workplace. I say this having said that I met my wife at the workplace and, uh, and, uh, and that I've been married now 42 years. So um, it's, a, it's a fine line. Um, although I was not in a supervisory position to her. <laughs> I, I think I have the distinct advantage as a minister of having a profession where building connections is part of my role here, and I love that. So when I go on vacation, I go to a top of a mountain so I can be alone, actually, and I connect with the universe then. But growing up, the third place I went to the most was the schoolyard and the street corner. And you could say that there were, how shall I put it, a lot of characters there. Uh, it was a dangerous place at times, but as a youth, I would rather go to a dangerous place than be alone. And that is the trap of loneliness, right? When we do not feel comfortable being alone with ourselves, and that, to me, you, you can not have loneliness and be alone, right? You have to be comfortable with yourself and who you are and, and get to enjoy spending time with yourself. But when you do not feel comfortable being alone with yourself and the universe, that is a trap. We might do things maybe that were, that's not in our nature to just uh, not be alone. We might conform to a group or society, peer pressure to feel not alone is real. And I'll tell you a story. I, um, when I was in Iowa, we brought in this uh, gentleman who was an ex-neo-Nazi. 
And um, you know, he was doing a tour, and, uh, but and it was really interesting. He told this story growing up. He grew up in a very dysfunctional family with violence. And so you know, when he was about 15 or 16, he left his home. And uh, he, he was very uh, violent on the streets. And, uh, and he felt lost and alone. And the only people who made him feel welcome were these neo-Nazi groups. And he found a purpose where he had none before. And he did things that were not in his nature, but to feel a part of that group, he did that. And he took in all of their doctrines and so forth. Um, and eventually went to jail. And I asked him, what was it that uh, made him leave, you know, get out of that life? Because it could have been very easy to slip right back into it. And he said, when I had nothing and I was looking for a job, uh, this Jewish businessman, even though seeing a swastika on my chest, gave me a job. He was the only person who would give me a job. And it goes to show how compassion and kindness can change people. Just talking to each other, getting to know each other. We had a Palestinian uh, from the West Bank and a, a Jewish rabbi from the West Bank. And they have come together, they start talking about their experiences, and they learn about each other. And literally, the thing that surprised me the most was that before they had gotten together, they, they had very little interaction with the other group. And, and now they are building something that they hope will one day lead to peace. But the story about the, um, the, the Nazi, or the ex-Nazi, was that he, he felt connected to this group, but it was not his authentic self. Now, I've been lucky in my life. I have had friends since childhood who accepted me with all my, how shall I say, quirkiness. And no matter what I did, whether I conformed, or there were times when I would not conform, and I found out in those moments who my true friends were, especially when I did not conform. And they are still, today, my best friends. They protected me in the schoolyard, and we will still to this day, I should say we protected each other, and to this day we are still there for each other whenever we are called upon. So let us be there for each other. Let us each know that we can call on each other in our times of need and loneliness, and so it is with this thought in mind that I call on you now to be as generous as possible as we take our offering, as we help the programs of the UUs of Sarasota. For those online or here on your cell phone, uh, there's a link to donate in the description of the YouTube uh, video and as well the QR code that's in your order of service. Let this sacred time begin.
Next reading is entitled, We Create a Web of Life by Reverend Sarah Lemert, and I'm going to invite you to join in on that line. And so let's start now. We create a web of life. This is finally the time to let go of that crazy notion that we can live separate and aloof from one another. This is the time, at last, that we can come home to each other in our mutual belonging. We create a web of life. And we create a web of life out of which every single one of us can use everything our stories have given us. We create a web of life. Every part of our lives, even the cruelty, even the abuse, even the addictions, even the loneliness, even the failures. A web of life is created within which you can rest in that knowing. Because out of that you can act. Out of that all your power is yours. Out of that you travel light. Out of that you can step forward. Let every encounter be a homecoming as we step forward now for the healing of our world. The world is not going to be saved by good people or noble people. The world is going to be healed by ordinary people like you, like me, who are not afraid of pain and who are not afraid of loving each other. May it be so.
Religious institutions can certainly be a third place, a place to go to be among others. And that in and of itself is, I want to again point out, if that's all it is, it's a limitation. Just being with others does not end loneliness. We have to allow people, all people, to be fully who they are. Some religions tell you in order to belong, that you have to say this specific thing or do this specific ritual. Peer pressure for adults, too, is real. And uh, they do and say things they do not believe just to feel a part of a religious group. Unitarian Universalism invites you to be your authentic self, to believe what you authentically to believe, but also to listen to others beliefs, to care about each other, whether you agree or not. And this is why the idea of this new idea of a fourth place has been created. Patricia Moose speaks of fourth places as communities for meaning making. I'm going to quote, as such, meaning making in a supportive and consistent community is crucial one wherein friendships are engendered in what Aristotle extols as their highest form of virtuous communion between souls, exploring and understanding their place in the universe in tandem. Unlike community spaces like social clubs, a place for meaning making rests on its non-prescriptiveness, there are no required rights to perform, nor cloaks of identities to don. Rather, it's a safe container to be illegible, know nothing for certain, to question everything, to fumble, experiment, and channel ourselves in the messy process of becoming." End quote. And I read that, and I see a description of Unitarian Universalism. And I think we see this here at the Unitarian Universalists of Sarasota's new mission statement, connecting in loving community to nurture the spirit and help heal the world. So not just connecting, but connecting in loving community. We have small groups, journey circles. We have men's groups. These, all of these give us the opportunity to connect with each other and to go deeper. And we have just the choir, I would consider, a, a group like that as well. Just the beauty that they make together. Um, our social justice uh, teams give people uh, opportunities for people to come together and work on issues that they are passionate about. Our children and youth connect through play and conversation during and after their religious education classes. There's an old, uh, an old phrase we say, you know, we teach children how to think, not what to think. And in his book, Growing a Beloved Community, Tom Owen Toll, Reverend Tom Owen Toll says, this mission of every Unitarian Universalist community is to offer an open door to all souls then to lovingly attend to those who choose to join our household. Outsiders are kindly welcomed and sensitively treated once inside. And Mu also says that instead of just giving people meaning, a fourth place incites the conditions by which people find their own meaning together and alone. And, and this is, we talk about the community of communities, right? Where within our communities, whether it's the choir, social justice, uh, small groups, each community has the power to self-determine how they want to create meaning. Uh, Mu also gives uh, seven indicators. You need shared context and shared interests. And two, friendships grow strong across varying topologies when aided, um, uh, meaning we try to get different ideas, that we don't all have to have the same ideas. But we, as although we are pluralistic, 
That means we have a relational idea, how we relate to one another as members. I call that a relational theology. Um, as well, it provides a low stakes way to try on a new way of being and spaces that allow for all a part of ourselves to feel more human, provide bonding and bridging mechanisms and creating high density of not only people but ideas and energy. And so programming that reflects the process of inward exploration and external meaning making and informed self-expression. So it's about expressing, listening, sharing, creating values together and then living those values out in the world. In the book, and, you know, and, and what this is about, you know, I talked about you know, these boundaries, this conformity, but it's about being able to break through and transcend sort of this conditioning that we have. And I, I was thinking about this in the book that, uh, and movie, Cloud Atlas, the character, Somni 451 states, and I quote, I understand now that boundaries between noise and sound are conventions. All Boundaries are conventions waiting to be transcended. One may transcend any convention if only one can first conceive of doing so." End quote. We're often so blinded into conforming to expectations so as to not be ostracized that we do not even think the impossible is possible, that we do not even, that we settle for where we are is good enough. But it is not good enough. If we believe we are part of the interdependent web of existence, then we are accountable to each other, and we are accountable to all who are suffering. And that is who we, as Unitarian Universalists, are. There was a time in this country when conventional wisdom said it was acceptable to own another human being. And Unitarian Universalists worked to break that boundary. There was a time in this country when conventional wisdom said women couldn't vote, and it was Unitarian Universalists who worked to break that boundary. There was a time not too long ago in this country that conventional wisdom said same-gender couples could not marry, and it was Unitarian Universalists who broke that boundary. We do not want anyone, anyone to be alone. And we know we can impact the world with our values because we have already done so. So let us continue to educate ourselves. Let us continue to listen to our friends and neighbors. Let us continue to welcome those into our community. And let us break down the boundaries that keeps anyone alone. Break down the boundaries of hatred. Break down the boundaries so that all people may find wholeness in this life, in this world. May it be so. Let us rise in body and or spirit for our closing hymn, Lean on Me.
Our closing words are from John O'Donoghue, Eternal Echoes. To be human is to belong. Belonging is a circle that embraces everything. If we reject it, we damage our nature. The word belonging holds together two fundamental aspects of life. Being and longing, the longing of our being and the being of our longing. Let us please now join me in extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you all for your presence here today. Go out, enjoy the potluck, and do good. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.